focusing teachers don't always find it easy to explain to students what a felt sense is. But some sort of explanation is called for because gender means something quite specific by the phrase. And in his psychotherapy writings, he spends a lot of time explaining how felt senses are different from ordinary bodily sensations or emotions, images, or other mental phenomena. He writes that there is no word in English that means what he means. That is why he had to invent the phrase. And Anne Weiser Cornell, who probably has more experience of teaching focusing than anyone else in the world, wrote a few years ago, after 33 years with focusing, I feel as though I am just beginning to really understand what a felt sense is. But I don't think that focusing as a practice is so difficult to grasp. Gendlin discovered focusing through noticing what some of his clients were quite naturally doing. And he wrote a self-help book that has helped many thousands of people to do this thing. What has proved difficult is explaining focusing or what focusing is to people who are unfamiliar with it. And I believe that most of that difficulty comes from a lack of clarity about what a felt sense is. Thus, it seems to me very important to clarify the concept of a felt sense. And such conceptual clarification is a central job of philosophers. Um, in an early paper on focusing, Gendlin laid out some guidelines for therapists who would be teaching focusing to their clients. He wrote, one must explain that it is possible to sense a problem as a whole. When you feel you have, uh, when you have a feel of the whole problem, don't decide what is important about it. Feel it all and don't decide anything. Wait and let the main crux come to you freshly. Gendlin often used the example of a poet who is trying to complete a poem. As they search for the line that will complete the poem, the poet's hand rotates in the air. This gesture tells us that they haven't yet got the final line, but that they soon will. It's different from simply not knowing how on earth to finish the poem. We might say that to have a felt sense is to sense something is on its way or that one is on the edge of something. Gendon himself has said something to this effect. He discusses an example where a person is talking about their fear of approaching an attractive person at a party. They say, I think I know what goes into that fear. It's that I've always been scared just to make a decision on my own. I'm scared it'll be wrong, but um, this person, Gendon writes, has a sense of the edge. Um is the felt sense. And when Gendon says the um is the felt sense, we know what he means, but clearly he is not saying that the felt sense is the utterance of that word. In the same way, the felt sense is not the rotation of the poet's hand in the air. I maintain, and Gendlin sometimes maintains, that also it is not the churning sensations the poet might have in their stomach. Our bodily sensations and responses are so bound up with the rest of our responding that they inevitably form part of the focusing process. Yet my conclusion is that it is a mistake to say that focusing is centrally concerned with bodily sensations. The sensations are important only because they are an aspect of our responding. They are what we feel in our body as we respond. Our responses may be mainly verbal or mainly imaginative. And although talking and imagining have an ultimate grounding in the body, it may not always be helpful to concentrate on the body sensations that we happen to have as we attend to our responding. The important thing is to stay with our responding, whatever form it takes, and then relate that responding back to our situation as a whole, so that this situation is thereby changed. 
So attention to the body can be important in focusing, but it only seems central if we picture the felt sense as itself a bodily sensation. Yet if we do that, we open ourselves to all the confusion that has for so long surrounded the idea of a health sense.